I thought it was appropriate that Danny led us in prayer tonight. Danny and Michael, her husband, spent uh, almost a year working at uh, one of your schools in the middle of the Amazon Basin, David. <laughs> Correct. I don't know that I can pronounce it the same way as you, but it's Gaia Aramerin. That's how I say it. How do you say it? Gaia Aramerin. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get anywhere close to speaking Spanish. <laughs> and we had, Carolyn and I had the privilege of spending a little while out there and uh, just seeing how God was leading that place. And uh, we had an amazing experience that we were observers to, really, on, on the, the week before we were to leave that the whole school campus was getting ready to run an evangelistic program in a nearby village. And do you know how they got people to come to that evangelistic program? They went out into the village and cut people's hair and then invited them to the program. Now that's a novel way, isn't it? So if you have any hair cutting talents, <laughs> you do. Oh yes, Steve, you do too. <laughs> and, uh, and then there were probably, what, Danny, 20 or 30 people who were part of the, including the students, who were part of the, the school, who had to be transported about eight kilometres to where the evangelistic program was to start. And for the whole time we were there, they had a, an old Toyota Land Cruiser that wouldn't go. <laughs> they also had a truck that wouldn't go, but it had been out of operation and gone off somewhere else for the last t 10 months while they were getting parts for it. So they only had little motorbikes that they ran everywhere on, like little scooter, Vespa type of motorbikes, and you're way out in the middle of nowhere, and that was pretty challenging for them. But you know what? Half an hour before the program was to start, and they'd been working on this thing for the whole week, <laughs> it went, and it transported everyone in relays to where the evangelistic program was going to be, and it got them all home again. Now, the next morning, Carol and I had to leave to go into the town to catch some transport to head, start heading home. And do you know what? That Toyota Land Cruiser wouldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> and we had one of the worst rides on the back of a lorry <laughs> along a rutted, red, dusty road. I had to throw my clothes out when I got home. They were so red yeah, from the dust. Um, it's all paved now. It's, uh, no more red dust. <laughs> You're doing it pretty easy. So we welcome David and we welcome Becky. And uh, you'll see Becky tomorrow, but she just couldn't stay awake any longer. So she's asleep in the back room. <laughs> but David, jet, jet, jet lag. Jet lag. <laughs> David, it's lovely to have you back in Australia with us. And we're really looking forward to this weekend. As you and Becky were about to go home last time, you had been here with Steps to Life. You are expecting that you might go back to Bolivia and as security for some money that hadn't be, been paid, you were probably going to have to go to jail. What happened, David? <laughs> yeah, well, I made that announcement in Brisbane. I found out that uh, uh, there, after 2008, uh, we were broadcasting five languages on satellite, which was an expensive, rather expensive satellite bill. But after 2008, most, uh, most income to nonprofit corporations went down significantly. From, for the average, it went down 50%. For us, it went down 30%. And so some of our most expensive operations, we had to reduce down to one channel. And so when we reduced our contract, that put us into a default situation with the long range contract we had signed some years before. We'd already been doing it seven years without a problem. But suddenly, the, the cut in income uh, forced us to reduce. And so we had this outstanding bill. And we went to the satellite company. And we said, don't worry, we will take care of it. And they said, we appreciate people like you to come and tell us that you're still planning on caring for us. I said, yes, we're making plans, we're working. I just wanted to assure you we haven't forgotten. So that when, they, when the satellite company went back home, uh, they, they found out that it already was in the hands of a collection agency. It wasn't in their hands anymore. And when they found out that we had intentions of paying, I guess they decided to get, they got very anxious and they hired the most expensive lawyer in Bolivia who used to be the, who used to be the, uh, ambassador to the United Nations for Bolivia. And, and, and he went after us. And w before I even got to Bolivia, he was already breathing fire and brimstone. And, and our, our poor, the young, la young lady that is our legal representative, she was going to go to prison. Yeah, now, that's part of the legal system in Bolivia, isn't it? That, that, that if you're representing yeah. a client. If there's any kind, of, yeah. any kind of issue, the legal representative goes to prison until it's resolved. Sounds like a good <laughs> idea, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to think twice to be a legal representative. Yeah. Well, she called me. She was in a panic, and she said, I'm going to go to prison, he told me. 
I said, don't worry, as soon as I get back from Australia, I'll go to prison in, in, in your place. And I'll t I'm, I'm higher than you on a, I'm the presidential organization, so you're the legal representative. I'm sure they'll be happy to take the president in your place. Yeah. Now, that yeah. wasn't the first time you've been in prison. Was, well, I know. The other one was I was hijacked, and that yeah, one yeah. was against my will. That's, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I called and I said, if anything legal happened, just wait till I get there, and you can, I'll take over that responsibility. So I went from Australia to Bolivia after we finished uh, the, the, the meetings. Uh, almost certainly uh, knowing that I was going to go to prison until it was all resolved. And here you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, God did a miracle. Because when I got down there, um, I met with the, the lawyer. The first thing he said was, he said, we want you to know that, that we're going to take everything you, you own and operate, the airplanes, the, the media center, everything. And, and I said, well, I, I know we have a debt, and I know you have the right to do that. But I said... Um, it's up to you what you do, but I believe God's going to decide. He goes, don't get God into this. This is not about God. And I said, well, we want you to know God owns everything. We don't own it. It's not ours. And so therefore, God will decide. And he goes, why do you always talk about God? <laughs> and I said, God paid for it. It is his. We're doing God's will, but we don't own it. So if you come and take it away, we will stand back and we will not uh, resist in any way. We're but we're going to continue operations like normal until, we can't, until something happens. He goes, you're not going to be operating as normal. We're coming to take it. I said, maybe. Why do you say maybe? Because God will decide. <laughs> and, and he was so frustrated with us. And, 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 then, and then he said, well, you will see what we're going to do right away. I said, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he kind of, he, I, I said, you know, you're a big hefty lawyer and you're, a, you're, you, you're used to making people scared. Are, are you, can you see that we're not scared? <laughs> yes. We're really not scared. We know we owe it, and we have an honest conscience, and we are going to pay it when God opens that door for us. But meanwhile, we put our case in his hands, and we will accept whatever he decides. Well, he decided to come and pay us a visit. And he paid us a visit out there, and he, while he, while he was there, he said, since you all are religious people, he said, uh, uh, let me ask you a question. I, w I went to put flowers on my grandfather's grave, he said, and while I was there, some lady that apparently was possessed came, and my grandfather talked to me and told me, we, I've been watching over since you were a little boy. And he said, I just want you to know that anything you need, I'm here for you. Just, just know that I'm watching over you. I was stunned because how could my grandfather talk to me when he was dead for many years? So I went to the cardinal, and I, he was a Catholic, and he was high up in society, so he doesn't go to a priest. He goes to a cardinal. Mm -hmm. So he, I went to the cardinal, and I asked him, uh, what should I do? My dead grandfather wants to talk to me. And the cardinal said, oh, don't worry. We do that all the time. He said, every time we go to the Vatican and elect a new pope, we invite all of the, all the dead popes from the past history to come, and they all come and join us. And, and they, they take their seat, and we know they're the, the dead popes from the past. And, and so it's not a problem. And so I said, do you want to know what the Bible says? He goes, what does the Bible say? As soon as I told him, he jumped up and he said, don't say anymore. I'm too frightened already. I don't want to talk about it anymore. And he left. But it wasn't long till he, start, he, he kind of got to liking us. And yes. he said, you know, now, he said, David, the company I work for that's hired me to, to get this money, they think I work for you now. They keep accusing me. <laughs> that they, <laughs> and we became very good friends. And, and God, I was praying about God gave us this, clearly this property. We have our own runway. The airplanes come and go. We have health work. We have the media work. And I said, Lord, you gave us this, and you're going to take it away? And the Lord made me a promise. Mm -hmm. And he said, they will not set foot on this property. And so I said, thank you, Lord. And so we began, continued working. That was two years ago now. It slowly toned down. And every time he calls me, once every two months, he goes, how are things going? Someday uh, you think <laughs> things are going to go out well? And so uh, the Lord has been... Uh, teaching me to trust him yes. and that when we go forward by faith to do his work it will succeed even if we're in tight times that is his problem not our problem now David you're part of a faith-based ministry that uh, has the initials GMI what do they stand for <laughs> gospel ministries international gospel ministries international and how many countries does gospel ministries international operate in uh, currently we're operating in 88 countries did you hear that 88 countries and what sort of uh, ministries are you involved in? Uh, we started out with mission aviation, yes. medical aviation. Then we added schools. 
uh, more schools, more airplanes, eventually got into orphanages, prison ministry, God opened a door for media with television and, uh, and radio, and uh, we do medical work in villages. We uh, also do evangelistic uh, campaigns in, in areas that have never been reached. Um, and um, it just keeps growing and growing. And uh, the people that we have trained, now they're going out and doing the same. So it's just, it just radically uh, expanding. It's an amazing story, but it's more than a story of how God leads mm -hmm. some, someone who steps out in faith and, and multiplies it many times over. David, we're really privileged to have you and Becky with us this weekend. And David's going to tell us another of his faith stories at the start of each of the sessions this weekend. Mm -hmm. So you've heard one, there are another five to go. Thanks very much, David. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful worship music. Jinkwee. <laughs> I understand they understand Polish. They know that means thank you. <laughs> when steps life asked us to come back again, I went into a panic. What am I supposed to say? I thought I said everything I have to say the first time. And they said, but people love hearing stories of what God is doing. They feel encouraged by real to life stories. And I prayed, well, the first year, I didn't have to worry about it because it was two years away. But then as I got closer into the last 12 months, I started panicking. Lord, what do you want me to say when I get there? I always love to tell stories, and I love to illustrate God's goodness and faithfulness. And I love to wake up people to the fact that since Jesus is coming soon, it's time that we learn the lessons to trust Him like we've never trusted before. And the Holy Spirit said, that's exactly what my people need to hear. We need to grow in a greater trust with God. But interestingly enough, within the last six weeks, my world has radically changed. In the last six weeks, I have learned some things that I have not learned in a lifetime. God has been very good. I wasn't looking for any answers. All of a sudden, God began to just open up things to me, and it made me dizzy as I began to understand some of the things that I'd never realized before. And I, I came excited to Australia because I want to share some of those things with you. Tonight we're going to talk about God's dream. And God's dream is actually, is actually what always his dream has been, to have a people created in his own likeness. And we're going to look at some, a few slides, a few references, to kind of give us a, a, a starting off point. But basically, it's the illustration of what God wants to do with us today. He wants a people that trust him. A people that will do exactly what he did. Trust his father. He said, of my own self, I can do nothing. And so I have learned in these last 19 years with my wife, what started out to be a one-year experiment turned out to be a 19-year experiment so far. The one-year experiment turned out to be such a learning experience that we never could quit. We went to the next phase and the next phase and it kept on growing and growing. And now we realize there is much more to learn that we didn't even know before. Uh, just at the general conference session in, in Texas, a young Australian chap came to see me. Uncle David, are you going to be there? Yes, I will be. I'm flying from Australia to see you. And I didn't know what he wanted. People come to see me all the time. But he came to see me, and he talked to me and explained to me his experience and what the Lord had laid on his heart. And I said, very good. Why don't you come to, our, to join us in Tennessee with our staff for a, a couple of months? And we will see what impact, what God has revealed to you, what impact it has on our team. Well, it was very, very positive. And then when it was time for him to leave the U.S., I said, would you mind coming to Bolivia, South America, and joining us there? He said, I have a ticket to Peru. When I get done with Peru, I'll be happy to come. And so he's in Bolivia right now, and he's recording everything. The last thing we did, he went and joined us uh, about three weeks ago. We were out in the jungles of, of, a, of a river in Bolivia, and with 20, 20 of our staff, and we were doing medical work. 
and evangelism on the, and from going from house to house and village to village along the river. And uh, we rented a boat and we were going up and down and he went with us. And afterward he said, could I just spend a little time with you before you leave? Because I know you're going to be going north. You will be having a wedding to perform. And from there you go to Brazil. And then from there you go to Ecuador, from there to the States. And then from there to Australia, I'll never see you again. So we took a little time off and he said, what would you like me to do? I said, do me a big favor. Before you leave Bolivia, I would like to record professionally all of the presentations you have. The presentations on the message, a beautiful development of the message that God gave us in 1888. And that needs to be revived and understood. And when I began, he gave me a book. He gave me a book called Heralding the Loud Cry. And this book will be available tomorrow night. We do have some copies, but this book changed my life. As I started to read it, I began to understand a little bit of the church history, a little better. Then I began to realize that it's not exactly the same. It has been prepared for our generation and it has had further developments. And sadly enough for God, the more generations have passed, I would say we're not as bright as we used to be. I think that we don't have evolution, we have devolution. And, and God has to make the message simpler and simpler for us so that we can grasp it. So even though the message is developed in beauty, it's also been developed into a form so beautiful and so simple children can understand it. And it solves a lot of problems. I was in Holland a few weeks ago. And, and uh, just before I went to Bolivia, I had gone to Holland to meet with all our TV network directors, television network directors in Europe. And while we were there, a, an older lady uh, raised all her life in the church said, I know Jesus is coming soon. I heard you preach today. And she said, I only have one, one worry. I've been working all my life to get ready for Jesus coming and I'm still not ready. What am I going to do? I said, that's the problem of a lot of Seventh-day Adventists. The, the, those of us that have been here for a long, long time, realize that our trying to get ready will not get us ready. Humanly speaking, it is not within our means to get ready. There is only one person in the universe that can meet the qualifications that God has, and that is God himself. Jesus, I found out as I was listening to his presentations and as I began to study, I realized Jesus has already lived the life of David Gates. He's already lived my life victoriously. All I have to do is accept it by faith, and it's mine. It's already finished. David Gates lived a victorious, 100% victorious Christ, uh, Christian life. Jesus did it for me. And if I accept his life as mine, it's given to me by faith. It's a gift, can never be earned. And if I accept it by faith and just believe it, it is mine. So, you know, have you seen that picture of a man standing before the judgment seat and next to him is Jesus, his intercessor, his lawyer? You might have seen that painting. Well, I began to understand it's not quite really that way. When, when our names are called, if we are hidden in Christ, like Romans 8, 1 says, there's there, there, therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If we are in Christ Jesus, when the Father looks at David Gates, will he please come forward? Who does he see? He doesn't see David Gates. He sees Jesus Christ. Amen. And he declares him perfect, no condemnation, if we are hidden in Jesus Christ. And my, his life becomes mine, and it's not my life that is judged. His life is judged and found to be perfect. And I have just been rejoicing in the good news that we can be ready for Jesus coming by faith, accepting the life that Jesus already lived for us. And I had been so excited because even though I knew that God could do it, it's, a, it's one thing to theoretically have an idea, and it's another thing to be absolutely confident that when your name comes up, you are hidden in Christ and there's nothing to fear. The judgment is a good thing for those that are hidden in Jesus Christ. In fact, to be declared innocent is a wonderful thing. I remember I was in South America, I'm sorry, in Trinidad and Tobago in the islands, they're working, and I, I had left a sticker off 
my car and my wife reminded me, David, you need to get the sticker on your car because uh, before we leave our car because it's going to expire while you're traveling for the union and uh, it, I won't be able to drive. Well, unfortunately, I forgot to replace that sticker and she had to go buy some groceries. She got stopped. She got a ticket. When I got home, she waved the ticket and she says, look what happened. I told you we would get a ticket. Go pay it. And I looked at the ticket and I said, oh, we still got two weeks to pay. I'll pay any time in the next two weeks. So about, about a week and a half, she reminded me, don't worry, don't remember, don't forget to, you have to pay. So I went down to the courthouse to pay the ticket, and the lady looked at me and goes, it's ex you went way too far. It says here you have three days to pay, and if you don't pay, then in three weeks you have to be in court. I misread it, the small print. I had three days to pay it, and I thought I had three weeks. So I had to break the bad news to my wife. She has to go present herself in court. <laughs> this, wasn't very, this wasn't very good news for her. So uh, we went to court that day, and, and of course, it's a, in, a, in, in those islands, it's almost everybody's black. And so she was the only blonde lady, white lady, amidst a, a sea of black. And some of them were in chains. They brought them out in chains like this. And so there she was sitting right among this group of people in, looking very conspicuous. And the, the criminals and others that were accused of crimes kept going up before the judge. And finally, they read out her name, Mrs. Rebecca Gates. So she came up. There was a little, uh, in the British system, there was a little uh, fence right there. And she had to come up to the fence and stand there. Your Honor, are you Mrs. Rebecca Gates? Yes, I am. And the judge held up the paper and said, Mrs. Gates, you are accused. And he held up the paper. couldn't quite make it, he held it up and finally he handed it to the policeman and my wife tried to help him and said, Your Honor, I am accused of silence. You can't accuse yourself. <laughs> so she just waited and they tried in vain to read what the policeman had written on that piece of paper. Finally, the judge turned to my wife and said, Because we can't even read what you're being charged with, we declare you innocent. You can go home. Where do I pay the fine, Your Honor? Fine, there is no fine, you're innocent. In that instant, I learned a lot about God. She was guilty. I was guilty. We should have paid the fine. But because of an intervening circumstance, we were declared to be innocent. She was sent home with no consequences, innocent, even though we deserve to have to pay. When our names come up before God the Father, and he looks at his son and he says, there is no condemnation. Welcome! What a joy that will be. And you know, once your name comes before the judgment seat, it's, it's eternal. That's a decision that is made and is not changed later. Therefore, we must be in Jesus Christ every day. We must be in him. We must have his robe of righteousness. And every night I've been praying, Lord, Please, as I sleep tonight, cover me with your robe of righteousness. I accept it, Lord. Just make sure I am covered. The life that Jesus Christ, his death was my death. His resurrection was my resurrection. I accept it. Now just live in me and do your will in me. And I sleep like a baby. When I get up in the morning, I put it on again. And I throw out the day, I put it on. And if my name comes up, it is okay. Because I know what's going to be declared. Because Jesus will be standing in my place. Now... As I've been learning this message, as I've been studying it, I'm not done, even done reading the book yet. I've been reading a little bit at a time every day. I'm, I only have about a fourth of it left, but the chapters get better as we go along. And it's a message we need to learn, and it's called Good News, and we, it needs to resound across the earth. More than 300 times, Sister White said, that is the message that is going to prepare us for Jesus' coming. It's a simple message. It's a lovely message. And we have a tendency to learn it because we have a tendency to believe, well, even, even when we say, you have to keep the Sabbath. Did you know that none of us really keep the Sabbath well? How many of us have actually learned how to keep Sabbath the way God wants it? None of us. Because our minds drift here and our minds drift there. In fact, if I don't have a piece of paper in my pocket and when an idea, a business need or a ministry need comes to my mind and I have to do it, I have to write it on a piece of paper so I don't forget it so I can deal with it tomorrow. Then I can put it out of my mind. But all these things come and I say, Lord, why do I have to think of all these things throughout the week? 
on Sabbath. Why, do, why are they there in my mind? Well, that's what we've been doing all week long. And sometimes we don't put them aside. Sometimes we sit there and we do things and you carry on conversations. I've learned that only Jesus knows how to keep Sabbath. The Jews tried to keep Sabbath. <laughs> in fact, it was not even God's intention to give them the Ten Commandments. But because of their unbelief, we are told, God spoke the Ten Commandments in grandeur from Mount Sinai, and he, he wanted a response different than what he got. You know what response he got? All that he says, we will do. Bang! Wrong response. What did, he, what did he really want to hear? Lord, we can't keep the commandments like you said. It's impossible. You've, you've given us a law that we don't know how to keep. But if you do it in us, then please live your life in us. That's what God wanted to hear. But know that they've always said, we will do it. We will keep your law. And the, in, in the sacred history, what is the history that we he read? Did they ever keep the law? They kept falling and falling and falling and falling. And they made more laws and more human laws and more packaging. To, and finally, when Jesus Christ himself came, they killed him. So when we strive in our humanness, we cannot do it. We have to surrender to Jesus Christ and just accept the free gift, and then he will live in us. And when he pours out his spirit in greater and greater amounts in the future, and as he pours out the latter rain, he will bring that fruit to maturity. And even to will and to do of his good pleasure is a gift as well. It is God who does it. He does everything. All we can do is accept it. Isn't that beautiful? But we have to accept. It is our choice to accept. If we don't accept, we lose the gift. We have to accept, and it takes by faith. Just because God said it, there's a children's song that says, God said it, and I believe it, and it's good enough for me. We have to learn to live that. Well, in the last few weeks, I've learned a lot about God, and I'm going to be sharing some of those stories and some of those principles. I've learned, I've learned that there are certain uh, rules of the game that I did not know about, that if I would have known about it before, I would have made some, done some things a little differently. And if we would have known about them earlier, we could have gone forward by faith more. Some things that are, that is, are not just options, they're rights. I didn't know that. I'm going to share some of those things tomorrow. Tonight we're going to talk about God's dream, and we're going to talk about how God wants to desperately, I would use the word desperately, desperately wants to come back, and he wants to see his image reflected in his character. Let's see if I can make these uh, go forward and backward. God created man, and he created man in his own image. This was God's dream, to have man in his own image, and he created them, and we'll find out how he created them slightly lower than the angels, and we'll read about it here. Let's go to the next one. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Here we have the decision of God to create a creature in his image. That, that was his choice, their choice. And they did it. Okay, next. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, Psalm says, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now, in some versions of the Bible, or in the original, you actually get the idea that he created them a little lower than the angels for a little while. It wasn't a permanent situation. It was a temporary situation. Like, let's give him a try, and let's start a little lower than the angels. But the intention was to eventually give him a higher position. Okay, next one. Man was made a little lower than the angels, yet when he shall be purified and translated to the heavenly courts, he will be even more privileged than the angels. Now, this is interesting. Sin made us fall, but when restored, he actually is re restoring us to a higher position than we had before the fall of man. Jesus became one with us, and then he adopts us, and he goes back home with with us adopted as his brothers and sisters. Okay, next. Heaven will triumph for the vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by the redeemed of the Lord. Here we have all these vacancies. Now, we don't know how many. A large number. We have a 
uh, a large multitude that no man could count? We don't know. We get an idea when, when we hear the redeemed uh, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. We get an idea that it's a very large number, millions. We don't know exactly. Someday we will know. But that vacancy is to be filled in heaven by the redeemed. It's a beautiful idea and restored to the actual family of God. It's not just a created race. We will be the actual family of God. Okay? Satan seeks to destroy this. This is one of, his, one of the things that with determined hatred we're going we're gonna to read in a minute. And here we have in Brazil, I've told the story in the past of a little lady I met, the head on the sidewalk. You might remember that story, the head on the sidewalk, uh, where I, I met this lady 30 years ago. And at those days, they didn't have cell phones. There was no cameras. You had to carry a camera. I didn't have a camera with me. But she drew a picture for me. And I, I laid down on the sidewalk and I was talking to her. And she was just telling me how excited she was, how God provided for her. She, at that time, she was 32 years old. Now she's 60, over 60 years old. But she moved to a different city in Brazil. And wouldn't you know, I moved to the city there last year and I found out she was in town. I went looking for her. I didn't know when I would turn the corner and find her. One day I turned the corner and there she was, Maria. And, and my wife didn't know who she was. My wife met her subsequently several months later. But I took a picture of her. Here we have a lady with no arms, no, no hands, no legs, a little foot, one little foot. That's all she is, a little bit bigger than one head. Satan has destroyed, in many ways, physically, the image that he created Adam and Eve, with the image of God physically. I, I looked at some of the things on the internet to see what to choose, and I, didn't, I couldn't choose any of them. They were too horrible. The way that humans are born today, deformed, and some of the things, they, it, it is so terrible, I did not want you to have nightmares tonight. So I chose none of them. I decided to choose one of Maria, which is about as deformed as you can get, and yet she's a beautiful, beautiful person. So some people have physical deformations while having beautiful characters. The next one, we will see that some people, I had to, I had to choose a, a drawing because I didn't want to show any real faces. They were too horrible. <laughs> I, some people are, may have a, a normal body, but they're deformed in character. Satan doesn't care how he erases that image of God. But erasing that image of God is what Satan is trying to do. How does he do that? He does that by what he feeds us. He does it by feeding videos, music, by feeding uh, literature, novels, by recreating crimes, by making criminals into heroes, repeating the scenes in front of us until people watch them or get addicted to them, and immorality, and blasphemy, and spiritualism, all of these things to be able to erase the character of God in us. That one that naturally turns to God and reflects God's love to others. And it has affected our families, it's affected our church, it's effect, affected every bit of society. In fact, as we, near, as we near the last period of Earth's history, and we are already in that last period of Earth's history, in the, the last stra um, um, sprint to the finish line, we might say, Earth is rapidly dividing into two groups. It's dividing and polarizing into those that are possessed by the Holy Spirit and those that are possessed by demons. It's a horrible situation. How many of you have ever seen somebody possessed? A few hands. It's a very, very not nice experience to see somebody possessed. I went to India and I was traumatized. I, I, I travel all over the world and I'm not traumatized hardly or cult, uh, culture shock, but in India, I saw so much, min, mem, uh, so much misery. People born, raised, and die on the streets. So much demonic oppression, so many idols that I, I, I left India depressed. And, and I realized how the devil just harasses people in countries where Christianity has not penetrated. How they live in misery and fear. In India, they have, uh, they have 300 million gods, they say. Well, they, probably, they're, probably they're, each of them is a demon, a different demon. But with that many gods, they have to serve him. When you serve one, you have to do another one and another one and another one. You can't appease one before the other one. Imagine having to burn your, your children in a fire like they did in the time of, of Israel. 
Can you imagine taking a little child and putting him in a fire? The human sacrifices still happen today. These things are, are out of sight, but they still occur today. Satan is looking to destroy the most precious thing that God has. And God feels everything we feel. He feels all of humanity. Jesus, Jesus was tempted in every form, but he also feels our joys and our pains. You can imagine when somebody suffers, even if they don't know who he is, he feels an intimacy. So when Satan tries to destroy or hurt or, or, or torture a person, he knows who he's really torturing. He's torturing God because God can feel it. Next, here, here we have God's ideal dream. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here is God's dream, a people, a people totally consecrated, without spot or wrinkle or blemish of any kind. That's going to happen. It is happening right now. I want to tell you that I travel to more than 100 countries in the world. I work in 88 of them. But I travel to more than, more than 100. I've traveled to them. And I can tell you, everywhere there's a revival happening. People are getting ready for Jesus coming. And there's a polarization happening. Is that polarization a nice thing? No, it's a painful thing. But people are making decisions. And it doesn't take a, a lot of bad decisions to quickly end up on the wrong side. Decisions today are dangerous because if you make decisions to reject the Holy Spirit, it doesn't take a long time for you to totally not hear the Holy Spirit anymore. There's not a lot of time. We have to learn a lot of lessons in a very short time. Well, what some people have taken a lifetime to learn, we may have to learn in a very few short months. But it is possible with God. But we need to get serious. It's a solemn time we live in. And so God is looking for, for a people, a church, a bride without spot or wrinkle. And he gives the marriage as an example of that. And, he, and this is what he's going. Let's go to the next one. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is where we're going. This is what God wants. This is his dream, and he will accomplish that dream. And so, and so as, we, as we watch what God is doing, and as we turn ourselves over to him every day, God begins to work his will in us, and our desires change, and, and our attitudes change, and our appetites change. Uh, the health message is prepared to, to, to teach us because our characters are are matured by the health message. Not only are we better physically, but also by learning to live in a healthful way, we are being disciplined to also feed our minds the proper thing. So it's a very important message. Okay, I think, I think that's the last. Oh, there's another one here. Okay. And I, and I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God's is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. As I was, you can, I think the next one is the last one, it goes back to that. As I was working in South America, uh, I've run across a lot of different people and a lot of different ways where people want to, you know, there's, South America is, is Latin America in general, tends to be Catholic. And there are a lot of beautiful Catholic people that love the Lord. They may not understand. They may not know the Bible, but they're looking for answers and they're praying for answers. And I've found out that if we, if we present them the beauty of God, they snap it up. Large numbers of people, just, just they're looking for that. But what they're not looking for is chaos. They're used to, they're used to solemn worship services. They're not used to loud, rocky music services. They're used to quiet beauty. And when they go to a place and they see that, they feel God's presence. And so if you present them a beautiful worship service like we had tonight, 
And if you, if, you, if you let them know what God has said, and you can open up their own Bible, the Catholic Bible, and show them all the life of Christ, they love it. And they're looking for that. And they want it. And, and so we have begun, we have begun uh, as many television stations as possible to reach those in the city. You can't knock on every door. But if you, if you broadcast into the cities, you can reach a very large amount of people. I was in, I was in, uh, uh, I'm, we moved to, I felt, let me back up a little bit. I was, well, for years I've been flying across the uh, Amazon in Brazil. And I've been flying, I've been looking down at that river and looking at all those people and saying, Lord, someday I want to reach those people. Someday, look at all those little houses along the river, way out there, hundreds of miles away from civilization. Lord, someday, well, someday came. And I decided to apply for my visa in Brazil. And uh, they told me, David, you'll never get a visa. You have to marry a Brazilian or have a baby there. And I'm not going to get remarried. I'm not going to have a baby. I think Sarah's too old already. I mean, my wife, Becky. And, <laughs> and, so, and so I said, I don't know if I can get a visa to live there. But I will, I'm, I'm going to apply. Lord, I prayed, if you want me to come work in Brazil, you have to give me a visa where I can live in Brazil. So we did all the paperwork and we turned it in. I was told, if they approve your visa, you will get two years. And then after two years, you can renew it again for two years. And then after that, the third time, you will get a permanent visa. Well, we turned it into the government and we waited. Six months we waited. Finally, the answer came. I opened up the paper and it said, approved permanent residency. Even my, even my advisors were shocked. And so they, they said, we've never seen this happen. I saw it. God has a plan. So we went to the embassy, got it stamped in our passports, went into Brazil, established a, a, a little place to live there. We started working. And, and I said, well, one of the things I'm going to do is fly airplanes here. So I went down to civil aviation and started taking all my exams in Portuguese. And uh, Portuguese, if you... If you if you speak Spanish, you can learn Portuguese easier. It's kind of like, it's, it's, they're related, but it just takes a little bit of time to figure out the vocabulary and understand what they're saying. Well, I'm about 95% fluent. So I, I went down and started taking my exams. And one day after I got done with the exams, they, they said, uh, you know, David, there is, there is a, a radio station owner here that would like to talk to you. He wants to sell his radio station, and he believes that you might be interested in it. Well, I'm always interested, but... <laughs> Money, I didn't have money, but you know what I've discovered? You don't have to have money to talk to anybody. So I decided to go talk to him. It's free. You can talk to anybody. So we had lunch together, and he said, well, I've been broadcasting for two years now. It's a very nice station. It covers all of the city, two million people. And he said, I've heard that you, you like broadcasting, so before I sell it to anybody else, I came to offer it to you. And I asked him how much. He gave me the price. And... Um, I said, how much time can you give me? Oh, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. I said, can you give me a couple months? No, 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 I got a bunch of people that want to buy the station. Uh, I just thought I'd give it to you the first chance. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, I'll take whatever you give me. How much? Two weeks. Okay, two weeks max. Okay. Well, I had to leave for Holland. And as I was traveling, uh, I was praying, Lord, what am I supposed to do in two weeks? That's a lot of money to get in two weeks. And when I have other needs too, and, and the Lord gave me an idea. You remember that one brother who bought you a, a couple of tractors one time? Remember he said, if you have any more needs, give me a call. Yes, I remember. Well, but this is a lot of money, Lord. Write to him. So I wrote him a little email and said, we're buying this radio station. We'd like to buy this radio station. Would you be interested in partnering? Maybe with a down payment? Since you asked me, since you invited me to write to you, and he wrote back and said, how much? And I told him how much, and he said, my wife and I would like to pay for the whole thing. I almost fell over. I wasn't expecting that. I was thinking of the down payment. So we bought the, the, the radio station, and, and we got on the air about a week later, because we already had a TV network running across the other side of the country. All we did was get the programming off, and they had a little internet radio station going. We just put everything on, and we were broadcasting. And it's been very, very exciting 
to do that. But two weeks later, another person we'd never met came to us and said, we, I just love your internet television station. It's really, really good. I'd like for you to broadcast it in every city of Brazil. Now, Brazil's a, a big continent, I guess. I guess you know what a big continent, a big country is. Well, Brazil is, is very big also. It's, it's, it's a majority of the whole South American continent. So it has a lot of cities. And so I, when he said that, I said, well, we need a national license for that. And, and he, he said, well, how much does it cost? I said, well, the cheapest would be a million US dollars. And then from then it just goes up. He goes, find one for a million dollars. So we called around and I put the feelers out and finally we found one for sale. And he bought it. And I began to realize, what would have happened if I had not gone to Brazil? Some things happen only because you go forward. And it's like putting your foot in the water. If you go forward, then things happen. If you don't go forward, and I began to, I look back at my experience and I realized, every time we have gone forward, God has opened doors. But when we sit and wait, and wait, and wait, and wait, guess what we do? We keep on waiting. This is one of the rules of the game that we're going to learn tomorrow, some of the rules of the game. And that is, God has certain things that he will do if you will, for example, if we pray, it says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. These are, these are the things that God has established. And it says, you receive not because you ask not. And then you receive not when you ask because you ask for it for yourself instead of for um, something God wants. So anything we ask according to his will, we receive it. But sometimes we're, we say, Lord, give me a safe trip. Get, bring me back safely. We ask for, for things and we should ask for little things. But what about praying for your neighbor? What about praying for a city? What about praying for a country? What about praying for specific people? When I walk along the streets and I see, do you see sad people sometimes on the street? You don't know who they are, but you can tell that their heart is breaking. And I'm just walking along and I see somebody going, I go, Lord, that person is so sad. I don't know who that person is. I'll never see them again. But please circle them with your presence and guide them and lead them and stay with them. And even when I forget to pray for them, don't forget them. God always answers our prayers like that, every time. And immediately, God will surround them and, and tell them, bring light to them, bring hope to them, whatever their situation is. And, and I believe God loves for, for us to pray for others and to pray for those that are hurting and to do everything we can. There are certain rules that we need to take advantage of. Whenever we pray, heaven answers. Every time. And so when we pray for things that God wants, he answers us yes every single time. When you pray that God's presence will fill somebody. Sometimes you pray for your children. You pray for your grandchildren. You pray for brothers and sisters. You pray for wives. You pray for husbands. You pray for grandparents and uncles and aunts and nieces and nephews. When we need to pray for them all the time. And you know, God will answer our prayers. He will give them a fair chance to get to know him. And they will have a choice to make. But... If we don't pray, there's some things God cannot do. And so God wants his people to think like he does, to be touched by the cares of others. He wants us to put our time and our resources where it hurts, where people are hurting. Not for ourselves. What did Jesus do when he was here? Did he take care of his own needs? Well, he prayed for his father to give him his daily bread. That's about it. Give us his day, our daily bread. Other than that, the rest of the time was spent taking care of others' needs, of sharing that bread with others. And God is asking today that, that we do the same thing. Our time, our money, into helping others who are hurting worse than we are. It doesn't take a lot of looking to find somebody who's hurting. I was flying with my wife the other day. I, you know, maybe my wife has been my co-pilot for 35 years. And I made two round trips from, from the US down to Bolivia with a mission airplane. The first one, I did it by myself. I was all by myself with an airplane full of equipment. 
and I went dropping the equipment in different countries as I went down. So a little bit in Puerto Rico, a little bit in Martinique, a little bit in Grenada, part of it in Guyana, then on down to Brazil for another drop off and finally made it to Bolivia with the last uh, equipment that was there. But on the way back, I was, she came with me and she made a round trip with me again. And, and so she came up and we loaded the plane up, did what we have to do and then made the trip back down again and dropping off along the way. And we, we were talking, you know, we're not getting younger. And, and God has been gracious to us. One of my prayers to the Lord was, Lord, I have more work to do than ever before, and I don't have the same amount of energy I did when I was 25, but I have more work to do in a shorter amount of time. So Lord, can you give me a faster airplane? Can you give me a bigger airplane so I can carry more and faster with less energy? And that's what God did. God gave us an airplane. A physician called me one day, or wrote to me, I should say, David, give me a call when you get back to the U.S. So I called him and he said, we have four airplanes. I'm downsizing. I would like to give you one of the airplanes. I said, doctor, what kind of airplane is it? It's a very nice airplane. It's a twin-engine pressurized airplane, quite fast. I said, Lord, may, maybe this is the way I can do more work with less energy. And, and he says, I'm going to give it to you. But first, I need to put it in the shop, because before I give it to you, I need to put on two new engines for you. Oh, doctor, thank you very much. <laughs> and then he says, I'm going to put some more instruments in there for you. <laughs> doctor, thank you very much. And there's some other things I'm going to have to put, prepare the plane for you because I'm not going to give it to you all worn out. It has to be ready to work. So it went into the shop and, and he kept doing this to it and that to it and that to it. And finally, one day, uh, he told me, okay, I've done everything I can do. It's up to you to finish the job. Well, when I called them about the bill, they said, you still owe $130,000. He'd done a lot to it, but... The, a lot more was done to it than what it, that he could pay for. So it took us quite a while. We had to learn, figure out how to finance it. We finally pulled the plane out and it was, financed the balance that was due. And we've been flying it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth across. And I have to tell you that it has been a, such a tremendous blessing. But the other pilots have been looking at me and saying, we want to work like that too. And so... God has helped a pilot just this last week. One of our other senior pilots talked to some of his financial partners, and they bought another airplane, similar, also turbocharged, not pressurized, but it's even faster than this one. And he says, we have more work to do than ever before, and time is getting short. And, and I have learned that God wants us to get more work done in less amount of time. It's not about luxury, because I don't think anybody who travels with me will consider it luxury. I had one... One physician had told me, I would love to accompany you down to South America sometime. Are you sure? Oh, yes, I, just, I would just love the adventure of it. If you do it, you'll never do it again. He goes, I want to do it. Okay. So we took off and we went down to Florida from Tennessee. He came to Tennessee. We flew to Florida. And I said, okay, it's 10 o'clock. At 2 o'clock in the morning... We're headed to Central America. So here is a blanket. Roll up under the wing of the airplane. I'll roll up on one, two, and we'll sleep for four hours. But what if we went to a hotel? If you go to the hotel and come back, you'll sleep two hours. Do you prefer to sleep four hours or two hours? Uh, four hours. Okay. So I said, it takes time to go to a hotel and come back, plus money. You have to rent a car to go to. So it's a lot of money to sleep two, less hours. So we slept for four hours, but it, it, cement is kind of hard, but it, it drizzled a little bit, but since we were under the wing, it was okay. Then we got in the airplane, and we headed right past Cuba, all the way across Cuba, hit Mexico, went down the coast, and landed in Nicaragua. Then after some meetings there, then we went on to Panama. We spent a week there in a youth congress, we finished the work in the, there, then we cut across to Colombia. In Colombia, we had a little bit of work to do. Then we cut across to the islands and, and Grenada. And then from there, we headed down to Guyana. And then from there, we went to Brazil. And in Brazil, after we finished with Brazil, we went to Bolivia. And we kept sleeping under the wing of the airplane. 
And, he kept, and when he got to Bolivia, he goes, uh, I said, you want to go back with me? Nope. I bought myself a one-way ticket back home. <laughs> so it's not about luxury. It's about getting the work done. And it's not always comfortable, but it is nice to get to sleep four hours instead of two hours. So the faster airplanes let you sleep for four hours. The slower one comes in two hours later and you only sleep two hours. So we were, we were grateful for what God has done. But I was talking to my wife as we were going down and saying, the Lord, is, you know, the Lord has been so, so good to us to give us the privilege of serving in so many countries. So many different projects that have start, started up and people come and join the project and start working. We have 300 full-time volunteers. And, and, and it is our joy to create opportunities for service. And as people come and serve, it changes their life. Then they go home, and their lives are changed, and they change other people's lives. That's why when they were talking, that Danielle and her husband, Danielle had, the, had prayer uh, earlier, um, she and her husband came down and served in Bolivia. And now, I'm sure their lives were changed. And now they're sharing that with others, and encouraging others to give part of their life in service. You know, all it takes is one year of volunteer service and your life will be changed. One year. Did you know the Mormons required two years? I was talking to a few Mormon young men the other day down in Guyana. And you know what they said? They said, we're not allowed to have cell phones. We're not allowed to do any emails. We're not allowed to call home until Christmas. Then we're allowed a little period of time to talk to our families. We have to focus on the work. And I thought, boy, 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 we have a lot to learn, don't we? They have 50,000 young men as missionaries working all over the world. And guess who pays the bill? The family does. The family sends $500 a month to the main headquarters to finance their child who's in the mission field. We have a lot to learn, and yet we have the most beautiful message ever shared with mankind, the three angels' messages. Righteousness by faith, the garment, the white garment that's given for free. We have this beautiful message, and how many missionaries do we have? Hmm? We have a lot to learn, and it is time for us to have an explosion. Of course, the explosion will happen, but it may come with a greater price than we think. It may come during the hardest times in world's history. Maybe with our blood, we will have to do what we could have done for free today. So God is looking for a people that share his passion. What is that passion? Reaching people. Everything. He gave up heaven. He gave up everything. He even risked, he risked his own eternal life. In order to come to this planet, he put himself into enemy territory, and he gave everything he had. Then he said, come and follow me. And so we are here tonight to focus our attention on what God wants us to do. And God is offering us his power. He's offering us his joy. He's offering us his peace. He's offering us his provisions. All of the resources that are in heaven at our disposal. That's what we're told in the spirit of prophecy. And Paul said, Paul said that According to his riches and glory, may God, supply, God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Everything that is needed to finish the work has already been provided. The problem is, will you claim it and go? By faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So this is the, this is the beautiful privilege we have. But it's not just a privilege, it's a responsibility. We have been blessed here in Australia with freedom. We have been blessed in Australia with resources. Amen. We have been blessed in Australia with good education. Amen. Have we not? Amen. Is that the truth? Amen. With, with privileges comes responsibility. We have been blessed in Australia with the presence of Ellen G. White herself who came and lived here and helped to establish Avondale and other ministries. God has himself directed the little, the little fledgling Seventh-day Adventist movement and built into what it is, a massive worldwide ministry. And the, the responsibility we have, and it's a very great responsibility, 
And that is to pick up the torch and finish the work under his direction. If we don't accept our responsibility, we will not hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Reading from last day events. Today, what is the biggest challenge we face? Page 156. We have more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. This is what we're facing today. Our own families, our own friends, our own church members are more of a hindrance to us than the world is. And yet we seem paralyzed. What is keeping us from launching out into the deep? What is keeping us from receiving all those blessings and the power and protection? We, are, we may be blessed financially, but we are very weak spiritually. We are not known for our great spiritual strength in the church. We're not even known for our great love in the church. <laughs> I bet if you would go to the community and take a, what do you call it, a questionnaire and say, these are all the churches in the community. Would you rate these churches according to their great love? Do you think our church would be number one in love? Eh, most of you are shaking your hands, your heads no. What would we be known with? We would be, no, be known by telling people, we have the truth. We're proud that we have the truth. But without love, even if I give my body to be burned, what good is it? Love is, is, the, is the package that carries the gift. If we don't have love, we don't have anything to deliver. God's love has to be first of all and foremost, the love for souls, the, the, and that's a gift of God. In South Africa some years ago, there was a, a little lady that got visited by two policemen. There was a racial difference between the two. And the two policemen arrested her husband and took him off. Then they came back about a month later. They beat up her son and they killed him. You can imagine the little lady, how she felt. You can only imagine because none of us have ever probably suffered that kind of violence. Then about a month later, they brought her husband back. He suffered terribly in prison. They beat him up, tied him up. They piled bundles of wood around him and they burned him to death in front of her eyes. I cannot even imagine, it's beyond my imagination how I would have felt. The desperate sadness of taking away even the last person you love, their only son and now her husband. Several years passed, there was a change in government Now there was a different race in government. They had heard about what happened to this little widow. So they called her in. They accused the two policemen of murder. They were found guilty on two counts of murder. But the judge decided to give the widow a chance to participate in the sentencing. So he called the widow up and he said, Madam, these two police that killed your son and your husband have been found guilty of first degree murder. What would you like the sentence to be? Well, she could have said, give him the same death they gave my son and husband. Lock them away forever. You know what she said? She, she said, they took away my son. They took away my husband. The two men in my life that I cared and loved for. I have nobody. Your Honor, if it's your will, would you please allow me to adopt them? 
that they may replace the two loved ones in my life. Make them change their name and take my name, that I might be their mother. And make them come and visit me every month for the rest of their lives. The court was stunned at that request. And of course, the judge granted her request. As I, as I look at that little widow's request, I realize no human power could have done it. Only God's love could have done that. Who in their right mind would have wanted to be related to those two evil men? And yet, for the rest of their lives, they were ordered to change their name to her name and to co-visit her as their new adopted mother. That kind of love the world is dying to see. They want to taste it. They want to see it. It scares them to death. Love always wins over evil. Evil is scared to death of love. But only God can give it. And when God gives us that kind of love, there will not be a problem filling the churches, let me tell you. In fact, unity. What was Jesus' prayer in John 17? Unity, that we might be one. How much unity do we have? We don't. We need that gift, don't we? God's dream is to have a people united, a people who can love each other. In fact, when they used to die in the Colosseums, they used to protect each other from the lions and the people, the Romans would say, behold how they love each other. Those Christians, look how they love each other. That is the biggest reflection of God's character there is, that if we can love one another. It doesn't mean we have to always see each other, the same, see everything the same way. It doesn't mean that we have to believe everything the same way. It doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything. You know what it means? I love you the way you are. It means our children need to feel it. Our spouses need to feel the love. It means our family members need to see it. It doesn't matter if you agree with me. It doesn't matter if you understand me. I love you anyway. And God can give us that. And if that is my dream that I have, is that I someday will receive that kind of love from God. I don't say that I have it. In fact, sometimes I'm unloving. But may the Lord teach me to be loving. May the Lord give me that gift of love so that I can think of others the same way that Jesus did. And that's Jesus' dream for his people today. A loving, united church that can receive the Holy Spirit. And when he has a people like that, it will not take a long time to finish the work. And you know it's going to happen soon. How's that going to happen? Well, in 100 years ago, over 100 years ago, Sister White said, not even one in 20 is ready. I wonder what she would say today. With all the worldliness that we have and the thousands and millions of baptisms we have, we have brought into the church when people don't, don't even know what they believe. Ask yourself, how many today would she say, we're ready? I'm glad to say that there's a revival happening. People are coming closer to the Lord. They're making commitments. I am encouraged. The best days of the church are straight ahead, but there's also going to be a cleansing process. There's going to be a vomiting process. When that storm hits, it's going to clean house. And when it does, whatever's left, they're going to be united. And they're going to stand together in prayer, kneel together in prayer. They're going to ask for the Holy Spirit. They are going to receive it. And that church united in love is going to finish the gospel in a very short time. God himself will finish the work through, the, through that. He doesn't need a lot of people. With 12, look what Jesus did with 12 people. Think of what he can do with 144,000. Be it literal or symbolic, we do know it's a small group of people. Not a lot, but God, all God needs is a small group of people to finish the work. Committed, united, obedient, surrendered, that he can cover with his white robe of righteousness. And I sure want to be in that group. We must strive to be in that group. It must become our very utmost priority. And yet, even though we know that, it doesn't become our priority very easy, does it? We have so many things to do. We have so many responsibilities. We have so many things. And yet, God is doing it right in front of our eyes. 
If we will by faith accept it, he will transform our characters for us. I cannot change myself. I cannot save myself. Only Jesus Christ can. And if he, if he says, David, I'll give it to you if you'll accept it. I'll give you the will to do and the will to will and I will give you the power and I will do the changes and I will take full responsibility. I will not only forgive you if you confess your sins, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness and I will perfectly reflect my character in you. I will do this. I will write my laws on your heart and I will take out your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. I will do that if you will let me. Are we in need of that today? Amen. Amen. That is the greatest need. And I hope this weekend, tomorrow, I keep, I keep wanting to go ahead of myself and tell you some more stories, but I want to save some for tomorrow because it is exciting what is happening, some of the things I've learned. And I want to tell you, I want to share some of those with you. And of course, when Brian interviews me, he wants me to tell some of those stories right before each sermon as well. And my wife should be awake tomorrow. She just, she just was falling asleep as she was sitting here. She goes, I can't, I can't, I can't. I stay awake. Go back, go on, go on to sleep. <laughs> and she has stories, beautiful stories too. God is drawing us closer together in unity all around the world. And I'm just so thankful for what he's doing. And I can't wait for the next months of earth's history. Things are happening so fast. Hang on to your seats. We're on a roller coaster ride. God is... I'm going to share some things. What you're seeing happening on earth reflects what is happening in heaven. I'm going to share some of that with you tomorrow. Things are happening on earth very rapidly, right? This is exactly what is happening in heaven as well at the same time. And we'll, we'll look at that more tomorrow. But tonight, I want to invite you. If it's your will tonight to say, Lord, I want what you have to offer. I want that white rope. I want to place myself in your hands. I want you to do everything you have to do. But tonight, I accept it by faith. And you can have total possession of me. Do what you have to do. Take who I am. Take what I have. I put it in your hands. Just fill me with your love. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Reflect your character in me. And cover me with that right robe. If that is your desire tonight, I would like to ask you to come forward for a special word of prayer. I know we're a lot in one little small, but if this is what you desire more than anything else, and tonight you want to tell the Lord, yes, Lord, that's what I want. If you can, step up here to make more room. If you're able to come forward, just come on up here a little higher, please. You see, God is, that's God's dream tonight, to do exactly that. And if you come forward, if you're able to say, Lord, just do it for me. I just want to accept it by faith. I can't do it on my own. I've tried. It won't work. I failed too many times. I just want to accept it. Please keep coming forward if you have a little room ahead of you for those behind you. Would you like to step up here? Please. If you're able. Just keep coming up in the room behind you there. Praise the Lord. The Lord can read your heart. He knows what you want. And tonight, I invite you to kneel with me if you're able as we ask, ask the Lord to do this special favor for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for that beautiful gift of Jesus Christ. As we look at his face, we remember Psalms 32, 8, that says, I will guide you with my eyes. Oh, Lord, we can only, you can only guide us with your eyes if we have our eyes on you. If we're watching you, then the slightest little indication with your eyes is what we need. We know that when to turn left, we know when to turn right, we know what to do. Lord, guide us with your eyes tonight. Forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take what we have to offer. We give, we give you everything we are, not very much, but you have blessed us with talents and skills and education and influence and life and energy. We give that to you. Everything you've given to us as well is yours also. We just place it in your hands and we say, Lord, now cover us with your beautiful robe of righteousness. May our names be written, Lord, in the books of heaven as perfect because Jesus Christ was perfect. And his life is my life. He lived my life. And he died my death. And he, he, he was raised and his resurrection is my resurrection. 
And we can be raised to new life tonight by accepting it as a free gift. Lord, your joy, your peace, we want it. Your love, which we don't have very much of, we want it. You have to give it to us because we're not very loving as a people. <laughs> we're judgmental. We're harsh. We, even with our loved ones. And Lord, that can't be. We want to have unity in our church. We want to have unity in our families. We want to have your sweet spirit living in our homes all the time. But we can't decide for everybody else. But tonight we decide for ourselves that we want to receive it. And by faith, without faith, it is impossible to please you. So by faith, just because you offered it, just because you promised, we accept it. And we thank you, Lord. And may you reflect that to a dying world, that they may see you when they look at us. Lord Jesus, tonight we have discussed a few, given a few examples. But Lord, the biggest example of this care, the biggest example of this miracle must be us. So do that for us tonight. We thank you. For, we receive it. And we rejoice in it. And tomorrow we will learn some more things, Lord, about what your plan is for us in this last generation. We love you. We thank you. Be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.